so uh, hello everyone. Uh, today uh, we are going to talk about uh, generative models, uh, but uh, this time without GANs, uh, as opposed to a SAFS lecture last week. Uh, and some of the slides and figures should be credited to a SAFS uh, lec lecture in the introductory course. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, we will start with a small recap of uh, Asaf's lecture last week. Um, so the objective was in a generative model to discover what is the distribution of the data and try to generate new instances that uh, align with this, distrib this distribution. Uh, and uh, the main approach that uh, Asaf discussed was uh, the latent space mapping, where you had a known latent space, uh, for example, normal distribution with the mean zero and standard deviation of one, and you want to find the mapping between this known distribution and the data manifold or the data space. And uh, usually you use uh, neural networks for, to find this uh, map. If you can please mute yourselves, I think someone, okay, great. Um, so just a quick recap of GANs. Uh, so we had the real world images and uh, we sample from these real world images. And at the same time, we have a generator, which is a neural network that receives latent random variables. For example, again, the standard Gaussian distribution. Uh, and the goal of the generator is to generate samples such that the discriminator, a second neural network, will be unable to distinguish between the real world images and images generated by the generator. And uh, this alternate training where the discriminator gets better and the generator gets better, uh, every time uh, usually makes, uh, uh, gives GANs their advantage of giving great results and high quality images. Um, so this is like a minimax game where the discriminator tries to uncover the generator and the generator tries to fool the discriminator. Um, so the pros of GANs, as I said, is very high quality results and you saw that uh, in the lecture uh, and uh, the fast inference time uh, if you compare it with autoregressive models. Uh, so just for those of you who don't remember, autoregressive models is just like the RNNs that you use in your homework. Uh, it's, uh, these are models that generate uh, uh, one by one the output uh, based on what it already generated. So think about images that have uh, thousands or tens of thousands of pixels or even more and if you, we want to generate the, the pixels one by one, it could be very exhaustive. Uh, so the cons of GANs is that it's difficult to train uh, and uh, it has been discussed. Second uh, is that the evaluation process is somewhat problematic. Um, Asaf showed you the auxiliary uh, methods of uh, Frechette inception distance and the inception score, but none of them really captures the essence of, uh, of a generative model. You don't know how well you, uh, the, your model uh, interprets the data and understands the data. Uh, and uh, these are just uh, auxiliary methods and they, you can see that uh, they are successful even in cases of mode collapse or uh, other types of, uh, of uh, problems in GANs outputs. And the, the last one is quite related and it's the mode collapse where it again does not represent everything that you want it to represent. So today we said without GANs, so we leave GANs behind now and we try to look at other uh, options for, uh, for neural networks that will give us uh, some of the advantages of GANs but hopefully without the cons. Uh, the agenda for today will be, we will start by discussing autoencoders and then variational autoencoders. We will continue with VQVAE, which is vector quantized variational autoencoder. It's just like uh, we will go through the evolution of autoencoders as uh, generative models. And uh, 
we will finish by talking about uh, something else, which is called IMLE. Uh, and if we will have time, uh, we will have like two bonus slides. Uh, so what is an autoencoder? Uh, these, uh, these are two neural networks connected back to back uh, where uh, you have an encoder and a decoder. And the overall uh, objective is to just output the same image uh, uh, through this neural network. But uh, you do it when you pass in the middle through a bottleneck layer, which is uh, extremely small compared to the image size. Uh, for example, for MNIST, if the images are size uh, 28 by 28, the latent representation can be just two numbers that uh, will represent the image. Um, but is this a generative model? Uh, meaning if I just uh, want to take now a new sample, to create a new sample, can I just generate new numbers for the latent representation insert them to the decoder and hope to get a three in this uh, setting. Anyone? You don't know the, uh, the distribution. To yes. Insert numbers. Yes, exactly. So I don't know the distribution in the latent representation. So I don't know where should I sample from or what is the distribution. So these dice are rolling and it's, it looks very nice, but I don't know how to uh, sample uh, actually, and this is how it looks like uh, if you just uh, put these two numbers that I said that latent representation has uh, on a grid. And as you can see, this grid has many holes and the encoder and the decoder are kind of lazy. They try to uh, spread all over the, uh, uh, as long as they, they can from one another, because it's easier for the decoder to know that if it has a sample here, then it should reconstruct the one. And then if it has another sample in a different location, it should reconstruct the seven. Uh, but um, transitioning from one uh, number or one instance to another may be difficult. Uh, and we don't know because the encoder is not limited in uh, the space it uses. Um, so if we go back to the notion of uh, latent, space representation, uh, latent space mapping, then we have a mapping to the data space, but we do not have a latent a known latent space. We don't have a predetermined latent space uh, as we had in GANs, for example. Uh, for that, uh, for that, to that end, uh, we have the variational autoencoder that looks the same, uh, if you look at it uh, in a high level, you still have an autoencoder that uh, its goal is to take an image and to recreate the same image at the other side. Um, but this time I want the, uh, the latent representation to be known. For example, the standard is normal distribution. So how do we do it? Uh, we split the, the latent representation we split each neuron to a mean and standard deviation. And then we sample from this mean and standard deviation. It means that the network outputs two numbers for each neuron, a mean and standard deviation. And then the network samples from this mean and standard deviation. But does anyone see a problem here? Anyone? I'm not sure I understood what does it mean that it samples this this, this uh, mu and the uh, sigma. Does it samples because it shows that it takes from each neuron uh, its value? So no, uh, you have here the green square that says sample. You just have like a, a vector z that each entry of the vector is uh, sampled uh, from a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Okay. Okay. So, but this sampling process is uh, non differentiable. Uh, we learned a lot about backpropagation and uh, how does the network learn, but this sampling is not differentiable as we would like. And so here we use a trick which is called the reparameterization trick, uh, in which uh, Z is actually assembled by taking. Run, uh, sampling an epsilon and normal standard Gaussian distribution 
uh, and multiplying it by sigma, then adding mu. The output Z is indeed normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, but this time when I want to uh, back propagate and see uh, which radiants flow to mu and which radiants flow to sigma, I have uh, a nice and coherent way to do that. But does anyone here see another problem? We talked about we want Z to be normal Gaussian distribution, standard Gaussian distribution with the mean zero and variance one. But then I say that the encoder outputs whichever mu and sigma that he wants. Um, so to this end, we try to encourage the uh, probability of Z to be as close to uh, the standard normal distribution. Uh, this is done by KL divergence, where we try to make mu as close as possible to zero and try to make sigma as close as possible to one. Okay. Any questions so far? Can you spin again? Uh, what exactly do you want me to how, explain how again? To make it, how to make it again uh, differentiable? Ah, to make it differentiable? So you generate a number epsilon, just treat it as a number. The, the fact that I take it from the normal distribution with the mean zero and variance one doesn't matter. Uh, we treat it as a number and all of these uh, actions that you see here, multiplication and addition, you saw in your homework that these are differentiable actions that uh, can be back propagated through. So if I want to know just what is the gradient uh, of Z with respect to mu, I can just calculate it. And again, with the uh, Z with respect to Sigma, then the gradients just go back uh, until it gets to the first neurons. But you again, you are saying you are sampling it from a normal distribution with zero and one. So what is the matter if I sample it from normal from zero and one or sampling sigma and mu? It matters because the sampling of, if, if you had sample just from sigma and mu, uh, then you wouldn't know how to back propagate through that uh, because the operation was just sampling a non-differentiable operation we divide this sampling process into two processes. One of them is unrelated. Think of it, the, the, the sampling of the epsilon is, uh, is outside of the network. It, it is not related to the network and it is not part of the feed forward process. The feed forward process just uses this epsilon as a number, just like plugging in a number from the outside and multiplying the weights by it or adding it to the weights. Uh, you can do it just like bias or just like everything else, but you treat it from the outside. Okay. Uh, so the, the epsilon is, uh, is uh, sampled once when initializing the network? No, it is sampled every time that the network uh, feed forwards the, uh, the, an image. But, uh, but uh, you don't uh, use this, uh, this sampling as a, as a process that you want to differentiate uh, through. You just have to think of it as you did in your homework. Uh, you, want, you get from the output uh, image, you start the, the derivations back through the back propagation. You arrive to Z. Now you want to know how to go back to the previous stage. The previous stage was sigma and mu you know how to differentiate with respect to sigma, with respect to mu, it's just an addition. You know how to do it. And again, with respect to sigma, you again know how to do it. You just save it aside the number, the epsilon number that you have, but it's just a random number that you get from the outside and it, does not, it is not related to the network. On the other hand, if I'd say that Z just took mu and sigma and sampled from them, then you wouldn't know how to do this back propagation. But uh, if you have any other questions, I will have, be happy to take it offline because uh, I think uh, we have to move on. Uh, I, hopefully I, you understand uh, this. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, so due to this encouragement of the latent space, you can see that if we take now, the, uh, we visualize the VAE latent space, you see that the things, uh, the, the, the uh, images are much more uh, compact in the space. You can see that the scales are from minus three to three, as opposed to minus 15 to 25. 
Uh, and you can see that uh, most of them are compact and surrounding the zero uh, mean as, you, as we would want. Uh, we can look at it as a, with a probabilistic interpretation. Uh, a generative model wants to make the log likelihood of the images in the data set as high as possible. Uh, if we use base rule, we can say that P of theta of X is just like P of theta of X given Z times P of theta of Z divided by P of theta of Z given X. In order to estimate this, uh, this uh, uh, expression, we use the two networks, the decoder networks, uh, helps uh, help us uh, to uh, to estimate the p of theta of x given z. Um, this was uh, uh, what you see here was what was suggested in the original uh, variational autoencoder paper. They suggested to output uh, a, a mu and sigma also for the image. Uh, as I explained for the latent space, but uh, in practice, uh, people do not use it and they just, we just output a, a value for the output pixel. Uh, on the other hand, we have the, uh, the P of theta of Z, that, which is known. We know it's a Gaussian normal distribution. Uh, and uh, we are left with a denominator uh, which we don't know exactly how to calculate because we have to do it with the same parameters theta and uh, it's quite problematic and uh, our decoder estimates the, uh, the uh, first expression. So uh, they show in, a, in a qua uh, several simple steps that this uh, denominator can be uh, estimated by using the encoder network with other parameters phi. Um, so we have here, like, uh, I, I will not get into the details of the mathematical uh, derivation of this. Uh, what I want you to take from it is that if I take log of P of theta of X and uh, do some mathematical manipulations, which are not that uh, complicated, uh, I arrive at that expression. So the first expression is P of theta of X given Z which is the reconstruction term, uh, exactly. I want to maximize the probability that X is indeed the output given Z. So it's exactly our uh, reconstruction loss. We want the images to be close. Uh, we want the input image to be close to the output image. The second term is the distance between the distribution, the encoder outputs and the prior distribution we had decided on which is the Gaussian distribution uh, with mean zero and variance one. So this is exactly our second loss term. It tries to make them closer. And the third term is intractable and we don't know how to calculate it. But overall, what I want you to take from it is that uh, actually minimizing the, the loss of the variational autoencoder gives you an optimization on the lower bound of the log likelihood of the images. So as opposed to GANs that uh, their goal was uh, just to fool the discriminator and two networks competing with each other, uh, the VAE goal can be interpreted as, uh, as lower bound of the log likelihood. And uh, as, lo as you make the lower bound higher, so does the likelihood gets higher uh, as well. Uh, so now we have a, uh, an autoencoder, a variation autoencoder, which is trained and uh, we can be happy and just generate uh, new uh, vectors for the latent space uh, because we know now the distribution and get new images. Uh, and as we can see here, the latent space, if I play with Z1 and Z2, as I said, with MNIST, we have only two numbers in the latent space. Uh, you can see that quite smoothly, we can transition from a number, for example, in the leftmost column, uh, from a six uh, to a seven, and in the way we pass through a four and a nine, and uh, varying Z2 may change uh, the pose, uh, the, the orientation of the numbers. Uh, so it's nice to see that uh, this latent representation captures uh, semantically meaningful uh, properties of the image. 
Uh, and they did this also for images, but as you can see, uh, these are not the best images uh, that you saw in these uh, generative model lectures. Um, and uh, there were some, some improvements in uh, variational autoencoders and we will show one of them now. Um, you can think about it, uh, these blurry faces as the result of uh, of, two, uh, of a tug of war, Meshichat uh, Hevel. One dog may say, I want a good reconstruction, which is the, the reconstruction loss, but uh, the KL divergence loss says, I want it to be close to the uh, standard normal distribution. Uh, so if, the, if one of them succeeds, then the other one fails and they have to live in peace with one another, but uh, this is the peace, so it's not that great. And now we will move on to the vector quantized variational autoencoder. Uh, we start with the same process of an encoding an image, uh, but now if I zoom in on this uh, last layer of the encoder, I see here three vectors. Uh, and what happens in the vector quantized autoencoder is that I want to discretize the process. I want to quantize the process. So I hold the code book in the side and uh, then in this stage, the quantization step happens where each vector is replaced with its nearest neighbor from the code book. Then this uh, output is fed to the decoder. It's now just another way to, uh, to have a prior knowledge on the decoder. Beforehand, uh, we knew that, uh, we knew that uh, the, the encoder outputs a uh, normal distribution. Now we know that the, the, the encoder can only output uh, vectors from this codebook. And the entire process looks like that. Uh, we start with an encoder, uh, we quantize the output of the encoder, and then feed it, simply feed it to the decoder to get the same image. Um, for, to understand the losses here, uh, I will just present a few notations. Uh, so X is the input image, X hat will be the output image. E of X is the encoding and Q of X is the quantization of this encoding. So the first loss is just like a regular autoencoder. We want the X hat uh, to be close to X. But does anyone see a problem here? I will give you a hint. We already seen, and uh, we've already seen similar problems before today. The hard select uh, uh, is operation is not differentiable. Yes, exactly. It's non differentiable. The quantization step is non differentiable. Um, so, uh, what they did was uh, just uh, skip this step. Uh, they assumed that the gradients in the input of the decoder are the same as the gradients in the output of the encoder, as if the quantization step did not happen at all. The second loss is the commitment loss. It says to the encoder, if you chose to be close to some word in the codebook, please do not be uh, hasty to change your selection. Um, so this commitment loss affects only the encoder. We have here the SG uh, symbol, which says stop gradient. We don't want the gradients to go to the quantization, to the, uh, to the code book. We want this to affect only the encoder. We want just the encoder to change its weights in order to be closer to the, to the words it already chose. And finally, we have the code book loss, which is exactly the second uh, direction, the, the other direction. Uh, we now stop the gradient for the encoder and just update back propagate to update the codebook words. Um, so now if you see, uh, these are reconstructions made by the uh, vector quantized auto variational autoencoder. Uh, these are uh, in the left, you can see images uh, which were uh, inserted to the encoder. And uh, on the right, uh, these images are uh, reconstructed by the decoder. And you can see that it looks better than what we saw with variational autoencoder. It's still a bit blurry, but uh, it's much better. 
Uh, but how do we sample new instances? Um, to do that, we know that uh, now the output of the encoder or the input of the decoder are known words, but we don't know how these words are ordered. Uh, think of it like a language. You know many words, but you don't know how to order these words in order to create a coherent sentence. So we learned recently about uh, a way to do that. Anyone wants to say which way did we learn to do that? To understand given a word, what is the next word? We oh, learned yeah. LSTM. Yeah, RNN, LSTM, great. Transformers, whatever you want. And so after the, uh, the variation autoencoder is trained, we, uh, we output all the quant quantized uh, outputs, uh, and then we take them, all of them, and feed them to an autoregressive model such as RNN. Uh, the autoregressive model, uh, given a word from the codebook, needs to say what is the next word from the codebook. For example, here it sees the blue word, and then it says that it has to have the yellow word afterwards. Once this is trained, we can now use this RNN to generate new decoder inputs, as we saw for language uh, too. We know how to generate new instances, new sentences. So the autoregressive model, for example, outputs this output. We feed it to the decoder, and then we get a new sample that we never saw before. And these are the results, uh, and it looks much nicer compared to what we saw with variational autoencoder. Uh, but if you look closely, uh, you will see that you are not really uh, able to understand what are exactly the things that you see here. We don't, I don't understand for, uh, for, for myself which animal is it here or what is it here, half car, half living room, half truck, I don't know. Uh, and so we need to find a better way to do that, but uh, it has potential. Neil? Yes. I have a question. Uh, the generator get some, uh, after a quantization, some codes uh, similar to the code book, right? The same as the code book, yeah. yeah so why not just take uh, my code book and sample from them uh, one uh, once, uh, ve vector or something like that? Okay, uh, it's the same reason why you cannot just sample words in a language, because then you will get incoherent sentences and, and there is a meaning to what the decoder learned. The decoder learned that each time it has a blue uh, word, it, has, uh, it needs to have a yellow word afterwards. Uh, otherwise uh, you will get with the inconsistent outputs so you're saying that the embedding uh, space uh, to the encoder give us is actually not one uh, one vector; it's a multiple vectors, and each vector we are you uh, quantized to the. Yes, exactly. Here you can see three vectors, for example. These are three vectors that uh, were uh, that are words from the autoencoder, uh, that are words from the codebook that are fed to the decoder. Uh, the decoder sees uh, in real life, uh, uh, they, they have like a matrix here of, of uh, 32 by 32 um, words, okay? It's, a, it's much larger. It's not a single word that we can just sample because if it were a single word, then each word would, uh, would, be, uh, would match to a single image and then we are done. We don't need a decoder. Okay. Okay. Okay, so VQVAE2, uh, which came a year afterwards, um, we start with the same process. We have an encoder and then we quantize the output of the encoder. But in order to capture finer details and uh, better to understand the global structure, we take a look at an intermediate layer of the encoder and try to quantize this as well. But how do we prevent uh, the two quantizations, the two vectors, to uh, uh, capture different information. 
so for to this end, uh, we we use this uh, final quantization as another input for this step of quantization. Uh, you just uh, upsample this and and uh, and add it to this uh, intermediate layer, and then you do the quantization step. When this is done, you feed both of them to the decoder and uh, you expect to get the same image again. The losses are the same. Uh, but now, since we, uh, due to this uh, dashed arrow that, uh, that, con that uh, makes uh, the encoder know that uh, there, they can be disentangled, uh, the, lower, the, the lower resolution uh, vector the smaller vector can capture global structure. For example, eyes above nose and nose above mouth and uh, sky above the ground. Uh, while this uh, larger vector can capture finer details and textures uh, and uh, they can be totally disentangled. This vector should not say again, mouth is uh, below nose because it already knows that uh, this vector captures this information. Uh, so this hierarchical structure is the basis for the VQVAE2, along with some other, uh, other tricks. Um, the, the sampling process is very similar, but now we have to train two autoregressive models, two RNNs, for example. Uh, the first one is just as we saw before. And the second one is conditioned on the output of the first one. Uh, so we train both of them. Uh, and once they are both trained, uh, we can use both of them to generate new decoder inputs. So the first autoregressive model generate a new sentence or a new uh, uh, vectors for the uh, for the small vector that, uh, that we insert to the decoder. And the second one then receives this as input and tries to generate the new uh, large vector. They are both fed in, into the decoder to get a new image. Uh, I should mention that uh, these autoregressive models are more powerful than the ones they used in VQVAE and they capture the, uh, the distribution of vectors in the uh, code book uh, better. Uh, and they use it here uh, self-attention and other uh, uh, complex methods. And these are the outputs. As, any, uh, as you can see, they look very nice, uh, much nicer and uh, generally uh, comparable with GANs. And so, these are the results and even for faces and you can see that we get very coherent and nice faces. Uh, and I just uh, want uh, to give a, a teaser for, uh, for a recent work, which is called DALI uh, that combines the, the ideas of VQVAE. I just wrote a tilde because it's not exactly VQVAE uh, and the transformers uh, to, uh, to uh, combine language with uh, images. Uh, so they have very nice results. I will not get into the details uh, of how they did it, uh, but, uh, but, but the general idea is again, combining transformers that can uh, take input as an, as an input, the sentence uh, and output these uh, quantized vectors of the VQVAE. Uh, and then they are able to get a sentence like teapot in the shape of Rubik's cube and generate these images or soap dispenser in the shape of a donut or storefront with PyTorch. So these are all generated images and I think it's very impressive and nice. And then now we leave the autoencoders behind to talk about the implicit maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, so back to GANs. Uh, we said that all outputs should fold the discriminator. Uh, so we have a data example and an output and the discriminator says they're the same picture. Uh, but this is prone to mode collapse as we say, and let's see a visualization of why is it prone to mode collapse. So let us assume that the squares are data examples from the data set and the circles are the samples that the generator created. 
So in the training process, uh, the discriminator makes the yellow regions as one and the white regions as zero uh, in its step. Then the generator tries to fool the discriminator, essentially pulling uh, the examples to their nearest regions. Uh, and this goes on and on, but we are left with dropped modes that are ignored in the final output in the final generator. This is because GANs only care about making each sample similar to some data example. Uh, it, is not, it does not care whether all data examples uh, are, uh, are represented or do everyone does everyone have a close neighbor. So I am a lead by, uh, come, to, come to solve uh, exactly this problem. Uh, I am a lead says, I want all data points to have some close outputs. So every data example says to its nearest output, why are you the way that you are? I want you to be closer to me. This avoids mode collapse and uh, it's easier to train. We don't have two neural networks. We only have one with very, uh, uh, very straightforward goal. Uh, we start again with the squares and circles. But now each square look, looks for its nearest circle and tries to bring in closer. This is the IMLE method and this is all it does. Uh, and after training, uh, no mode is left, uh, is left uh, without a uh, nearest sample. Uh, every, every mode is, uh, is represented in the output. Um, and as you can see results here for a segmentation map to a, to a real life image. And you can see that, uh, that the IMLE has many possible outputs uh, because it does not drop uh, any of the modes. Okay, uh, so to summarize, uh, we talked about alternative to GANs, overcoming some of the problems we presented uh, in the beginning of the talk. Uh, so we talked about autoencoders and then variational autoencoders, which are already a generative model. And then a VQVAE, uh, the vector quantized autoencoder that we saw that uh, is uh, able to produce very nice looking results. And we finished by talking about IMLE, which is a different way to, uh, to approach this, uh, this uh, problem without GANs. And just before we wrap up, I want you uh, to uh, I want to show you a recent work of ours um, that uh, uses other, uh, other type of non-GANs generative models. Uh, so I want you to uh, this is in the single image uh, setting. Uh, we have a single input image. And we want to create new images from the distribution of this sim single input image. To this end, we create a pyramid of the single input image. And then at each scale of the pyramid, we employ a patch GAN. Asaf briefly mentioned it, but this GAN is responsible that the output patches and the input patches are indistinguishable from one another or from the same distribution. And uh, this is the output at that scale. Every time we take the output from the previous scale and upscale it as the new input from, for the next scale and so on and so forth until we get this output. So we begin with two carrots and end with three carrots and it's very nice and the image is uh, coherent and globally uh, nice uh, due to the uh, course to find structure. Uh, the randomness comes from the uh, bottom level which is uh, an unconditional GAN. It gets noise as input and should output uh, a new image, which is from the same distribution of the input image at that scale. Our suggestion was, uh, oh, sorry. The main principle, as I said, is, was that, that in each scale, the output patches belong to distribution of the input patches. This is the patch GAN. Our idea was to just replace this GAN uh, with the patch nearest neighbor model. Uh, that all it does is just replacing uh, every patch in the initial guess, which is this image, uh, with, the, uh, near, with the nearest neighbor from the uh, input image at that scale. 
Um, and the randomness comes from, again, from the bottom scale where we just uh, replace the patches randomly. Um, so the main principle here, instead of just output patches are from the distribution of input patches, the output patches will be indeed input patches. Uh, and this process of using patch nearest neighbors takes roughly two seconds for these kind of images, uh, while GANs take uh, approximately one hour or more. And uh, you can see here results. Uh, these are uh, 50 generated images from the single source image that you see on the left. Uh, on the mid in the middle, you can see our results and you can see that we play with the global structure and the, the fine details. And uh, on the right, you can see the results of a uh, single image GAN. And you can see that uh, our results are less prone to artifacts and uh, other uh, uh, problems that GANs present. Uh, and that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. How much time do you take to train uh, this kind of network? It's not a network. It takes two seconds to generate new image. <laughs>